and welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Thanks so much for joining us on the program today. We have today on the program a returning guest. It's really a pleasure to have her back with us again, uh, Ancharya Ancharya Shunya is our guest, and she has a new book that's going to be out in September. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to listen to a portion, an excerpt from her website, uh, that is the audible version of Roar Like a Goddess, Every Woman's Guide to Becoming uh, Unapologetically Powerful, Prosperous, and Peaceful. And uh, uh, Ancharya Shunya, thank you so much for joining us again here on the program. It's such a pleasure to have you back. Thank you for having me on. Such a pleasure. Our last conversations uh, were so interesting that I said, let's let's make this a, a recurring opportunity here or um, uh, interview, a conversation, because of uh, the things that you have to share with us, I think, are, are most important, especially in light of your... Uh, uh, just in, in light of your own lineage, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about that as well, being the, one of the first female heads of uh, a 2,000-year-old Indian spiritual lineage. Uh, for those who have not heard the previous programs or conversations, give us just a little bit of a background on that lineage that you, uh, that you carry on. In India, the spiritual work carries on through families, that become committed to teaching the ancient Hindu scriptures and trying to live that knowledge. And these scriptures are the Vedas, which precede all religions that emerged in India, precede Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism. They're just a way of life, a conscious way of life. And I'm fortunate that I was born in one such family. It seemed normal on the surface, but I then found that there were hundreds of people coming and going in our home, sitting down to listen to what my grandfather, great grandfather, what they had to say. And then I realized that I had been born in a significant family, in a significant family. And then um, I did not know that destiny had planned that I would become the first female to be chosen to lead it. And how timely, I think, in the 21st century that my grandfather saw that I had it in me. I didn't see it at that time. I was really young. I was only 24. But now in my mid-50s, I think my grandfather knew that I could handle it. And I'm here to speak up for all women, whether they are in the domestic world, professional world, or spiritual world. Yep, we can do this. Yeah. Well, women are doing it, and uh, what's really interesting is as uh, time goes on, uh, our history is being, um, I'm going to say, added to, because there are aspects of our human history that have been left out, intentionally or otherwise, and uh, it's fascinating to see the contributions that women have made to our societies and our civilization that have helped us to move forward, and yet, the women are not given, uh, at the very least, the credit, let alone the honor that they deserve as a part of humanity, half the population, you know. And uh, I know that for there are some women who, who kind of take that very personally uh, and so forth, and other women who take it in stride and say, okay, well, then I'll just have to do what I have to do uh, to live my purpose and my life's calling and so forth. And it sounds to me like that's what you're doing. Yes, that is. Because this Vedic tradition that I forward, people in India are sometimes surprised. You're a woman and you're taking it forward because for a while there, it was the belief that women are not supposed to be the conveyors of this great wisdom, like, like we're not enough. But then when I, because I'm a scholar of the Vedas, I realized Poo -poo, this is not real. Like you said, uh, historically, if you look into the Vedic tradition, it was actually 27 women have contributed to the Vedas. They have written the Vedas. They mm. have built the Vedas. And now there was this patriarchal setup that came forward that said, no, not, not for women. And um, I'm one of those women who said, no, that's not true. And I use my scholarship, I use my ability to communicate and be on the world stage to shine the light on women's contribution. And it's not even about 
carrying on with my life as such, my story, because it's beautiful and powerful and I'm roaring in it. But it's really about now bringing that roar and bringing that self-acceptance, self-respect and unapologetic beingness to all women, really, Richard. Well, there is an aspect that I don't think a lot of people are aware of from a biological standpoint, uh, that every human being who has ever come into existence from the moment of conception for I'm not sure how long a time is female. Uh, that that uh, and I did uh, matter of fact I was taught that in biology and that was back in high school I'm 62 now so that tells you how far back that goes but then I did some more research just recently to find out that that actually that is true and that at some point our DNA that has been created for us as individuals the information in there says okay add another X add an X or add another Y chromosome. I mean, it's just based upon that information in the DNA, i.e., even for that matter, we'll go even deeper metaphysically and say that that individual said, I want to go into my next lifetime as a man or as a woman, and then that information is then transmitted to the DNA. Uh, so it seems very uh, hypocritical of our societies not to give women the the due that they deserve considering the fact that we all started out as female i mean it, yes. I, I just you know what i'm saying yeah i totally agree and 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 that's why i'm also proud to bring forward a tradition that was from long time ago but it's forgotten or distorted today which began as prayers to the mother first so it goes like this Matra Devo Bhava, Pitra Devo Bhava, um, Guru Devo Bhava, mother comes before father and even before the guru in a spiritual tradition. Uh, it's really going back to it. But then somehow over the annals of time, forget all these great ideologies. Somehow we all decided to forget the role of the mother, the woman, and even Mother Earth lies trodden and abused. <laughs> and and tarnished yeah you know and so there is this overlooking of the feminine principle in general and my effort is now to reclaim it first within me richard and thank you your your words and your insights are are, are so compelling and and i wish there were more men to speak like you and to acknowledge the role of women and the woman the woman's body, the woman's womb, the woman's genital to begin with. It is so sacred. Well, I will first tell you that my wife uh, was given, she had asked her, I'll say mentor. Uh, his name was Sunyata Saraswati. Mm -hmm. And he, he, she asked him for a new name. And she was given two choices. One was, uh, of course, uh, uh, Shakti. The other was Amrita Ma. And she took the latter, which, of course, is translated, uh, at least as far as I understand it, Nectar of the Goddess. Now, I intuitively or internally, I guess you might say, understood exactly what that meant. But there are a lot of people who don't understand the concept, if you will, of being a goddess, in t in, especially in light of the book, Roar Like a Goddess. Can you help us to understand, uh, shall we say, the definition? What, what is meant by goddess? There is undoubtedly a divine feminine principle that is nurturing and um, holding all of us. And when that principle is viewed through the lens of mythology, through the lens of our human imagination and its unlimited capacity, we can imagine a deity like Durga, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Shakti, as these all-powerful feminine deities who are not only nurturing us, but they're also empowering us. They are not only making us formidable in our strength, 
but they are also teaching us to be wise, kind, and intuitive, kind of like an ideal. All the good qualities coalesce together to become a cosmic goddess. And when that same goddess principle is seen within, is known within, is connected within through um, inquiry, through contemplation, through meditation, through mantra chanting, and through just sheer uh, emboldened living, then it is said that your goddess is awakening from within. She's not just this cosmic entity with a fancy name like Amrita Ma and Shakti and Durga, but you are that Durga. And Durga literally, even if you look into these words, then Durga literally means the one who can overcome obstacles. And every time I'm able to do that emotionally in my life or professionally or societally, then I feel like, yeah, go Durga. That's what's happening within me. And for example, when you are Amrita, when you become the self-nourishing nectar, when you become your own savior, when you become your own liberator, your own cheerleader, then you are goddess Amrita. So uh, really these are archetypes that can be considered external, but my goal in this book, as you asked, has been to awaken these archetypes eternally, um, which are eternally available within us through a, a whole, whole complex of behaviors, attitudes, and um, enjoy really at the end of the day. Acharya Sunya is my guest today here on the program. We're talking about her latest work, which is Roar Like a Goddess. And again, it's the subtitle, Every Woman's Guide to Becoming Unapologetically Powerful, Prosperous, and Peaceful as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it's really a pleasure to have uh, Acharya uh, Sunya with us here on the program. And uh, we are uh, talking about a book that uh, will be available in September, and you can actually listen to a portion of the audible version that uh, you, uh, Acharya, you narrate actually and i was able to listen to a little bit of that a little earlier and uh looking forward to when that comes out i've actually ordered the audible version and of course they'll let me know <clears throat> through my uh app or what have you when it's uh, when it's available i'll download it put it on my phone and so forth and uh, looking forward to listening to that as well uh when we talk about the work that you do um and especially as we're talking here about uh, the goddess. Uh, can you share with us about the journey to radical self-acceptance and recognizing your, uh, as a, a, a female of the species, uh, your uh, innate worth and wholeness? Because I have a feeling that is one of the biggest issues that women across the globe face is, I guess you could put it in the context of uh, extremely not all women, but many, extremely low self-esteem, low self-worth and value, and that they really don't have anything, they've been told they don't have anything to contribute, almost along the lines of what you were told uh, early on, and you said, uh, no. <laughs> Share with us your, your insights on that. It has been indoctrinated into us that we're not equals, and even though it may not be a conscious content that we have digested, I really feel that patriarchy is like an invisible virus and it's been around and it's in the air that we breathe. And it could also be passed on through our mother's DNA to us. And in that DNA is the shrieks of uh, millions of girl, child, girl children who've been put to death at birth or which is burned at the stake, uh, or women burned for dowry, or, or told to have, um, to take their place, which is to shut up and be quiet and mm. open their legs. And, 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 you know, this stuff I was researching in the process of writing my book. I always do that. I research back into the ancient scriptures and I research into the modern times and 
the modern, what's happening today. I always, I feel like I'm a bridge between times and eras and traditions, but the voice that was stifled all along was the woman's voice. And really, I think that um, it's not enough to, I thought that it was not enough to say, come on, have some self-worth. It was also important to have role models of radical self-worth. So then I realized that what helped me, because I did go through a period of time when I walked out of my first marriage, something no, no in my culture. And if I'm a spiritual teacher, I should have it together and either be celibate or monogamous at the least. And here I was walking out of a marriage, but with it was with my head held high. And where was I getting this inherent invincibility, this self-worth, like, like a blade of grass is not apologetic, a rose or a sunflower is not apologetic, a sparrow is not apologetic. Why are we women apologetic with our held, held down in shame and we're over seducing, manipulating, explaining ourselves? And that's when I went to the goddess scriptures and I found that, gosh, even these goddesses faced obstacles. They were made to feel smaller. They were sexually objectified or they were told that they're just a slip of a woman and no more by these hordes and hordes of demonic masculine forces. And this woman, this this gal goddess stood by herself. And I have this image of her in one of the mythological stories where she's sipping wine while she's fighting them with her one single, you know, sword. And she's laughing, she has humor around it. And she says, I'm just playing with you. When I'm done drinking my wine, you know, that's it. That's your end. And I found these really powerful goddesses. Like there is goddess Lakshmi, the goddess of abundance and wealth. And I found a story in which she felt unseen by the people around her who just used her for all the good luck and good fortune that she brought them but they didn't really value her. And what did she do the moment she had that realization in her mythology? She gets up and leaves. She just leaves. And then when she re-emerges, she finds herself a new partner, but a partner who don't look, didn't look at her with greed for what could Lakshmi bring him, but it was the, the look of true love, the look of meeting her for who she was. And I found this so beautiful. So I interpreted it for the modern woman where sometimes we take abuse, take the second place um, for money, either at the professional level or at the domestic front for security. But here was she who said, you know what? All abundance can wait. First, I have to value myself. Our self-respect is the most important wealth. And when she gifted herself that, she becomes a goddess of wealth and abundance for the whole world. But if you go deeper, because if you go into Hindu calendar art, you see this gorgeous goddess dressed in gold, giving you money and wealth and gems and jewels. And we're done with that. But then I unpacked the mythology and I found that she could be this person because she's loaded inside herself with self-love and self-respect and self-value enough to take decisions that support her. So I'm not teaching leaving relationships or entering them. I'm just saying, can you make self-value an important priority? Because when you do that, you become a goddess Lakshmi in your real life. When I did that, when I've said no to situations which felt like they were not, were, they were not reflecting the respect that I deserve it may be for a momentarily, it may be a difficult moment, but when you turn around, when I look around at my life, I realize those were the times when I leaped ahead in my prosperity, in my abundance, and ultimately in my self-respect. How does that sit with you, Richard? It's just fine. I grew up with uh, four sisters uh, and a mother <laughs> with uh, a brother and a father. So we were outnumbered, at least as far as male to female, uh, but we never felt like we were on the outs. Uh, there wasn't a, a, a them versus us uh, by any means. 
<clears throat> and we actually were able to survive. We were probably in about a 12, 1300 square foot, three bedroom. Now remember, five females, three bedroom, one bathroom house. And yet we all came out alive. <laughs> So I have no problem with that. I would uh, quite honestly much rather live under more of a matriarchal uh, society. However, and I want to talk about this as we continue here, uh, I want to talk about um, this aspect that a lot of people think with feminism, for example, and women finally starting to speak up, you know. Um, the, the I guess it's, what, the Me Too movement here in the States and so on and so forth, uh, that a lot of people have a misconception that women want to take over. Whereas from the spiritual aspect, metaphysical aspect, it's not about taking over. It's about joining, shall we say, joining forces to co-create. And we'll continue doing so as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, along with uh, Acharya uh, Sunya. She's written a book called Roar Like a Goddess. And uh, we, she is doing that here on this program today, uh, sharing with us her what some might perceive, I'm sure, Acharya, uh, as radical okay do you consider yourself a feminist is that the right word or is that word has that word been opted uh and there's you they're using the wrong definition if you will and that, that maybe another word needs to be chosen if true tellers are feminist then so be it i'm a true teller and i live that truth yeah Okay, so let's talk about uh, this aspect of uh, we, we've been living for centuries under ostensibly a patriarchal or male-dominated society. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of, of that is borne out in the New Testament when after Jesus' crucifixion and burial and his resurrection, who is the first person to see him? and know who he was. It wasn't his apostles, it was Mary Magdalene. And I, I still contend to this day, she should have been the first, if you're gonna have one, she should have been the first head of the church, if you will, uh, because she was the one who knew who he was. I still think about this in the context, she went to reach out, you know, to touch the, the hem of his garment, if you will, and I paraphrase it this way, said, he said, no, 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 not, not yet. The paint isn't dry yet. Just don't touch. <laughs> because he was still in, in process, I guess, uh, through of, of the resurrection. But I find that, that that particular story is glossed over. Whereas when his apostles came along, they're basically, uh, yeah, oh, we're so sad. Our, our master is dead. And uh, we, we, can you direct us to the nearest pub where we can knock back a blow for you know, for his life and so forth. It's so sad. And they were talking to their man. They, they didn't know who he was. Uh, and I find that interesting. So how about this aspect of uh, a, a patriarchal system being replaced by a matriarchal system? Is that really what the feminine part of the population wants? I doubt it. I think the female has always been a collaborator collaborated to a fault at times, but it's our strength really. We see, we recognize, we make space. We nurture the male seed within us. We give birth to male children. I doubt if the female, the empowered female wants to see a world from a place of ridiculous conception. I think we just want to, um, we want to see a world where where we are equals and where each is given their due credit and why just a male female world i think i think the feminine conception of the world has place for everyone people of binary and non-binary genders if there were more women leaders if there were more women uh, heads of churches and temples and societies i think there would be generally more acceptance less suffering, uh, less alienation, more uh, friendship across the board. And all these female goddesses that I talk about are great friends with their male consorts, Durga, with Shiva, um, you know, 
Saraswati, with Brahma, Lakshmi, with Vishnu. And they cooperate and co-create and collaborate for the sake of our universe. And that is my goal. As an empowered woman, I enjoy relationships with men and different gendered people across the board. I live in a universe where we are, we are each other's strength. We're not pulling each other down. At least now I live in that world, the world I have created. Mm. where I have chosen to express my roar and I only surround myself with people who are who, who are willing to see me as the goddess that I am. There are others who want to pull me down and I just don't give them credence anymore. And it's a choice. Yeah. Well, that's part of what we talk about here on this program in terms of giving people choices and knowledge of those choices to help make their dreams come true. And uh, as we continue here on uh, the program, I let our listeners know that uh, this program, of course, is here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. and Wednesdays at 9 a.m. That's our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. And we also broadcast live on a stream uh, at richarddugan.com. And our, we have podcasts as well, this one included on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, many other locations. And we are on YouTube. And we encourage you to subscribe so that you can be notified uh, when a new conversation is available for you to listen to. We hope that you will do that. Uh, one of the other aspects that we promote here, uh, Acharya, is, um, is uh, participating in what we like to call the decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, where we ask people to go within and listen to that still small voice. Talk to us about how important that is, regardless of male or female, of, of um, one empowering oneself through that still small voice. This definitely is the decade of cultivating our internal life to be able to listen to that inner voice. In the previous decades, though we have been progressive, we, our search has been outward. All my work is really about listening to that voice, which is beyond gender, beyond form. It is beyond religion, culture, any human conception, and even one. If deep inside you and deep inside me, if we really listened, we would listen to that same voice and that voice would talk to us about radical love, oneness, joy, peace. And so these are eternal values known as dharma in our culture. And that voice will never, if we really calm down, we might listen to our ego for a while there, but if we really develop an inner life, and we plug in, we're gonna find that there are teachings coming forth from within us to be truly, truly human, truly kind, truly generous. And yet at the same time, I have to say this, Richard, that women have been leading this movement forward to go in, but then sometimes it leads to a woman bypassing the uh, the situation that is in front of her. Like she may be quick to move towards peace or kindness or forgiveness or radical oneness. And that's where I feel that while we listen to this inner voice, this universal voice, the voice of love and truth, it's also important to roar in your daily life because protection of your physical body, your boundaries, your um, sentient needs is important at the same time. So that's something that I'm doing. Like I had always been, I always have been a teacher of exactly this work. And I hope you understand where I'm coming from, where I say, and at the same time, we need to be able to embody, for example, rage as a dharma, as a righteous emotion when it's needed to protect us. And if we listen deep inside to connect these two, if we really listen quietly, as I started doing in my life, I realized that I had permission from time to time to embody my rage, to raise my voice, to ask for what I need, 
to say no and to mean my yes and live and die for it. We're talking with Acharya Shunya. Book is entitled Roar Like a Goddess. We hope that you folks will take the time to go to her website as well uh, to find out more. AcharyaShunya.com. That's A C H A R Y A S H U N Y A dot com. We'll be linked to her website. Uh, make that easy for you. All you have to do is click on uh, the information there from the uh, from the podcast, uh, and and, and uh, basically go there, listen to the uh, f read what she has available for you. Uh, I know that you also have a lot of other things that you're offering aside from the book. We'll talk more about that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and Acharya Shunya is my guest here on the program as we talk about um, this whole aspect of the feminine in our society um you know you made the comment about uh, uh being unapologetic especially when it comes to expressing emotion and i think this is one of the biggest hypocrisies within the patriarchal society that it's okay for a man to get really you know even if it's a politician okay but if a woman gets angry oh she's hysterical uh, must be, and forgive me, no disrespect, must be that time of the month. Uh, you know, and all of these different uh, uh, prejudicial kinds of comments, you know. And it's like, wait a minute. Um, she is also a human being who has the same emotions as you, you knucklehead. And she has every right to stand up and voice her opinion. And this is the other aspect of it, too, that is very disturbing. Of course, this transcends male and female is the criticism that athletes, uh, members of uh, uh, the movie and television industry, actors and so forth, uh, or anybody who has, so to speak, a public uh, persona, and it, it doesn't have anything to do, let's say, with uh, speaking out, and then they speak out and they're criticized. They'll shut up and go dribble your ball or, or, or uh, hit the ball with the bat or kick the ball in your European foot or whatever it is or stick to the movie set or the TV studio. It's like, wait a minute. They have as much of a right to speak out on issues as you or I do. And especially here in America where the majority of the criticism is, it's like, how is it that because they're in these respective industries, they don't have the same rights to speak out as you do? That didn't, and then, of course, if you're a woman, it's even worse. I agree with you entirely. And I think this decade can also be about looking at how our collective mind has decided to create boxes and force fit people, entire genders, professions, colors, races into those boxes and then we want predictable behavior and predictable um, speech from them and i think we owe it to ourselves to loosen up some of those zippers and padlocks and open them and just breathe yeah and uh, come into our shared humanhood and this is where I personally am a very emotional person, a passionate person, and I will laugh quickly and I will have tears quickly. And, and I do that on the world stage when I'm teaching, I'll have tears. And somebody commented to me, like, you know, like the spiritual teacher box, like I'm supposed to be this cold, frozen, above everything kind of a person uh, speaking in a monotonous, somewhat grave voice. And I said, what humbug is this? Mm. I'm a spiritual teacher because I own all of myself and I own how the goddess uniquely roars through me. And so I made it intentional to be even more dramatic, more transparent, more everything on the world stage. And yet when my students come and study with me, they realize they're talking to a voice that they would rarely meet. And it's it's just what it and it, this comes from this confidence comes from owning myself and not trying to walk the script yeah. of how a spiritual teacher should be. How should a podcaster act and behave? It's like, where is the room to to be the unique you to sing the song that's unique to your soul? 
And essentially, that's what attracts everybody, that rare person who can be unique. And yet we have, we seek it in others. And yet we stifle it in ourselves. You know, it's really rather ironic, if you will, that we don't take that same exact position, the hypocritical position, I'm, I'm saying, when men and women are in joy or in bliss. They're laughing. They're having a good time. So, oh, my God. It must be must be off their meds or something because they're just too loopy or whatever the case might be no 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 they're having they're enjoying life they're having having a great time and so on and so forth and it's like but you and again when you talk from the dualistic standpoint of emotions it's like okay the positive emotions those are okay but the negative emotions oh no 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 uh men can get up but see there's the other other irony too is within the uh, I'll say the, 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 the female or the feminine side, it's not okay for men to get upset and angry. It's like, wait a minute, I'm upset and I'm angry, but I'm not allowed to be, and I'm not saying in terms of, of a lashing out and being violent physically, I'm just saying, I'm upset and I'm clenching my fists and I'm just, you know, doing one of these. And then I'm told, you know what, you're scaring me. I, I, I you don't, you can't do that. It's like, but if she does the, exactly the same thing, uh, you know, then the male is expected to, you know, sort of say, it's okay. No, go right it. You, you feel free to do that. Go ahead and express yourself, you know, and it's like, wait a minute. And it's almost a, there's almost a, a sort of a backlash in terms of, um, and I'm curious what your perspective is in terms of this backlash towards men who then are not allowed to, uh, in appropriate ways, express those quote unquote negative emotions, especially like what you hear, Man, big boys don't cry as a little kid is told, you know? Yeah, thanks for raising that important point. And I believe that we should look at a root problem, which is a false belief, which is patriarchy. And in patriarchy, both men and women are stifled by expectations, roles, and scripts. And so one of the scripts that men got due to patriarchy is that boys don't cry and real men don't, you know, f express their feelings to the point that they become automated robotic and once in a while they have to explode just to survive because mm -hmm. all that emotional buildup they don't know how to channel it women on the other hand are told how they should be and and as a result what's happened is that women should forgive women should pacify women should be the harmonizer women should you know reach out emotionally first so women could also intellectually step back be a bit detached, be a bit robotic, and maybe think whether they should make that move or not. And I really feel that we need to stir up this whole cauldron of roles, really. It's not about men and women um, against each other or not understanding each other. It's like we have to collectively look at stepping out of these scripts that have come down to us through the millennia over centuries. And we don't even know how we subconsciously started walking in. And so if I look at my own life today, I can say, I don't really know which parts of me are feminine anymore and which parts of me are masculine, but all parts of me are intelligent, discerning, somewhat detached from the situation to figure out what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And then I act. So there is a strategy here, not in a calculative sense, but in a the way an intelligent human being should come forth. Whereas a bulk of people just come forth from their gut scripting, where they're either stuffing their emotions or releasing them. And then society comes along and plays the bad cop to men if they release steam. And uh, the woman is the eternal victim in that sense. We really need to shake up the whole situation and roaring like a goddess is not just for women, but it's for men too. And it's for people of every gender who want to bring in that intelligent roar, that dharmic roar, and that ease with emotions where we humans 
gosh, Richard, we have really villainified uh, emotions like rage and even grief and even jealousy. Mm. Whereas all of these have divine beginnings and ends, we need to take our torchlight and look at them. Like if I'm jealous with someone constantly, I tell my student, don't just think you're a bad person for feeling jealous. Go deeper. Maybe you yearn for something that the other person represents. Maybe that jealousy is reminding you of the work you have to do within you. Similarly, grief is it's like a cleansing, like it allows us to transition mm -hmm. from one uh, phase of life to another. And anger is um, the messenger that tells us that our boundaries, physical, emotional, social, verbal, sexual, are being violated. And if we, if an entire gender goes dark on anger and suppresses it, then of course we'll have to need the Me Too movement because... You know, we didn't know better. We didn't get angry sooner and we didn't express it. And we didn't develop a healthy relationship with, is this an unconscious entitled anger that's just ruining my health? Or is this conscious anger that I must sit with, that I must journal with, that I must find a way to express? And, or is it super conscious anger that makes us write books that makes Mandela free a whole, you know, a whole race in his culture that made Gandhi take a walk and make salt when the Britishers said you can't make salt in the open sea. It's like superconscious anger leads to planetary changes. Conscious anger helps you make changes in your own life. Unconscious anger breeds ill health and destroys relationships. But do we even have these conversations? Oh, no. We preach to each other and ourselves, anger is bad, peace is good, <laughs> joy is good, temperamental, grief is bad. We've really, we're very mature in that sense. And we really need to, first of all, anything you feel, it's happening within your divine being. Sit down with it. Say hello. Have a cup of tea with it or drink a glass of beer with it, whatever is your preference at 4 p.m. in the afternoon and explore it. Be curious about your own emotions rather than um, labeling them as good or bad, wanted, unwanted, uh, stupid or enlightened. Roar like a goddess. Every woman's guide to becoming unapologetically powerful prosperous and peaceful the three p's here on tell me your story i'm richard dugan your host and acharya shunya is uh, my guest shunya acharya shunya is my guest uh, roar like a lion <laughs> yes roar like a lion roar like a goddess uh the, the the lion shall we say or lioness if you will um i what i find so interesting and i have to tell you that i have struggled or had struggled for so long with this whole concept of dualism. I mean, you kind of broke down the, you, uh, th that aspect from emotional standpoint of the dualism that we, we talk about. But <clears throat> one of the things that I finally have come to the realization that allows me to be who I am regardless of what I'm feeling is that there is no dualism, ladies and gentlemen. Things are the way they are. And I use the analogy of the macro and microcosmic worlds. We look through the telescopes that we've got out there, Hubble or James Webb, and we look at the universe and how things are moving and crashing and exploding and doing all of these things that we sit there and ooh and ah over. And there's no judgment out there. The things that are happening, there's no judgment. It's just, that's just the way things are. And on the microcosmic world, looking through an electron microscope, for example, at the subatomic sub level, and you see the same basic kinds of activities going on at that level of things moving around and dividing and splitting and d uh, joining together and exploding and on and on and on. And again, another ooing and aahing, but guess what? There's no judgment there either. But for some reason here where you and I live, there's judgment. And I finally came to the realization uh, uh there's no judgment it just this is it is what it is uh you know if i've got a negative amount in my bank account eh, i mean it is what it is 
if I got a positive uh, in my bank account. It, it, it is what it is. In other words, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't necessarily express an emotion over, you know, you don't express frustration and anger and fear over a negative versus expressing joy and happiness and bliss over a positive. It, it, it's just what it is. But that's not to say that we don't express, I'm not saying that we don't express our, our emotions. Your, your, your aspect of uh, the, the, the reality, if you will, in this world of Maya, of dualism, versus the fact that they're really, in the grand scheme of things, on all levels of physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, multidimensional, whatever you want to call it, there is no dualism. It just is what it is. It just is what it is. And 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 this is the beauty of the goddess archetype Saraswati, who leads us from this this coalescing of like, oh, there's a goddess of power and then there's a goddess of abundance. But ultimately, when we start contemplating on her archetype, even in this book, I journey from duality to non-duality. Saraswati makes you realize that really when you needed power to survive, you needed, you thought of Durga, you thought of that same oneness as Durga. When you needed abundance and pleasure to be happy, you thought of that same oneness as Lakshmi. But now as you meditate within, you find that same oneness as your own true self. And that there really is no multiple goddesses, gods, people there really is that one self and that coming home of that message that though there is multiplicity it really is an appearance at some level and it all coalesces into that one awareness that is bigger than everything this awareness in our heart can hold everything how vast is this inner galactic sky within that we can hold all of this and at that time, you become bigger than this whole universe because you can contain it. And probably this is the coming home of beginning a journey in duality, living in duality, but really knowing that none of this matters because non-duality is the only truth. Mm. This is a fascinating conversation regarding Roar Like a Goddess with our very special guest, uh, Acharya Shunya, here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and uh, I, I want to ask you about the three aspects that you have focused on. You, you mentioned many different ones. I'm familiar with quite a number of them, uh, of, uh, of uh, the f goddesses, especially with, uh, within uh, the Vedas and the Gita and so on and so forth. Why did you choose these three specifically, Durga, Lakshmi, and Saraswati, as opposed to th any of the others? There are thousands of goddesses, but in some sense, these are considered the trinity, the divine feminine trinity. We have a masculine trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and we have a divine feminine trinity, and this is Durga, Lakshmi, and Saraswati. And Durga is the same as goddess Kali too. They are one and the same. And Durga really represents that... Um, the, the first level of, she's also called a warrior goddess because we perceive life like a war in the beginning. And she brings us all those clarities and attitudes and convictions that we need to be successful in the war and, and to fight a fair war and to be ethical. So there's Dharma taught by Durga. And now that we've won the war, we want to enjoy and that enjoyment is represented by Lakshmi. But again, that enjoyment is ethical, it's dharmic, and it's also connected with liberation and, 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 and like a flowering of the being, because now there is peace in your life. That's when you learn and grow. So it is said that Lakshmi brings you to your teacher and will, you know, Lakshmi will ensure you read the right book so that you can thrive in peaceful times. And now that you've been enjoying life, there's a third phase that happens to all of us. We've, in, we've taken enough vacations. We've studied with the guru who's the outer guru. We have, you know, enjoyed every 
privilege in life, but now it's time to know who I am. Mm. What is my connection with this universe? Um, what's going to happen to me? You know, where was I before this body and after this body? What's my connection to the divine feminine dimension? And for all these deeper teachings, the same one God has become Saraswati. So it gave me a great paradigm to bring for the whole journey from fighting those wars to enjoying the pina coladas to <laughs> ultimately meditating in life. It's like we need these goddesses along the way to teach us between right and wrong, power and disempowered behavior, sleepwalking and conscious behavior. And I felt like these goddesses and their trinity, wow, I can use them to create a whole map for anybody who wants to journey from disempowerment to empowerment. Well, um, I happen to carry in my wallet I've been I, I and I also have one uh, uh, at my at my desk here at the office, uh, a picture of Lakshmi. I carry her uh, in my wallet uh, because of what you've uh, specifically, of course, of what you've t just been talking about in terms of what she brings. Uh, I also have to say too, from my perspective, it's just my perspective, uh, folks. Um, in relationship. No matter what level it's at, boyfriend, girlfriend, married, you know, and so forth, I don't own her. She doesn't own me. She is a free moral agent just as much as I am. It's the level of commitment that I have to the relationship and to her that that drives me forward. But if it makes her happy to go off and do whatever it is that she feels she needs to do for her life. I say, go for it. Go do what you need to do, uh, because uh, just because we're married, that doesn't mean she loses her individuality. She doesn't lose her uh, her sovereignty. And you wrote a book called Self Sovereignty. Talk to us a little bit about that aspect of what our spirituality, or is that more on a physical level? Uh, uh, the the issue of sovereignty. Sovereignty is an important aspect of spirituality. And I wrote my book, Sovereign Self, because I wanted to talk about the three kinds of relationships that we all have as humans. The first relationship is with people. And, um, and then there's another relationship with things like my boat, my necklace, my house, my car. And believe it or not, these are relationships. We spend a lot of time nurturing those relationships with our things, like all our profession work time is spent in <laughs> taking care of these two types of relationships, mm -hmm. the people in our life and the things in our life. But there is a third relationship and it's with your own self. And that gets neglected or, or spent or overburdened or hustled, you know, hustled out, mm -hmm. pimped out, so to say, to take care of these other two relationships. And the whole journey to sovereign, being sovereign in relationships is from recognizing that they are important. I don't recommend not having relationships with things and people and then sitting down and oming away because I feel like it's temporary bliss. Mm -hmm. You really have to be in the world. That is the lineage that I come from, which is known as householder sages where we have houses, we are householders, and we are like sages. So we want to uh, have this relationship in, we need to prioritize a relationship with ourselves, our internal life, even people who are listening to our conversation. This is really investing into your third relationship, which is the relationship with the self. And when you spoke about how your partner is a free moral agent. First, I love those words. And, and truly, these are independent systems of life, breath, consciousness, divinity that are collaborating or, 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 or nodding to spend some time in timelessness together. Yes. Really, that's what my partner is to me and your partner is to you. We're just like these complete galaxies 
that are willing to that have voluntarily agreed to spend time together and and we're going to move on my eye on my journey and my partner on his journey you on your journey and your partner on their journey never probably to meet again as this same richard and his partner but if we can make this time fruitful functional supportive of divine masculine divine feminine or divine non binary whatever that be that's fine it's a choice mm-hmm. and you talk about choices and it's a choice and i never really forget the fragility of this interaction with my partner that i do enjoy now like how time bound it is and yet how timeless it is yeah and and and, and i'm going to see him again probably in some other birth in some other form and when i meet the soul my partner i should know that i roared with power with pleasure and prosperity and allowed him to roar with power pleasure and prosperity and peace all the way really acharya shun oh, by the way richard can yes. i can i show you my wallet yes. lakshmi can you can you be me or so our viewers can have benefit of both the lakshmis i will uh, i will do that right now see i think I we have sure the same no... lakshmis Oh, there yeah. they are. <laughs> a Lakshmi <laughs> moment. <laughs> uh, now, uh, help me to understand. There's one other. Uh, I don't have this in my wallet. I don't carry it with me. But there's also. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, god or goddess. Uh, maybe it's a god, uh, but it's embodied as an elephant. What is the name? I can't remember. Ganesha. Ganesha. That's right. Ganesha. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and and I'm trying to think uh, of the meaning thereof. I, th- I think that has something to do with uh, prosperity and abundance. So Ganesha is the remover of obstacles. Ah, that's it. Yes, and, and, and that is why often Lakshmi and Ganesha go together because Ganesha opens the doors, removes obstacles, and Lakshmi follows with abundance and flow and relaxation. Yeah. Very good, very good. And again, there are so many. I mean, as you say, thousands. Uh, I have barely scratched the surface when it comes to uh, the Gita's. The Gita, there's like the Gita. This is one of the fascinating things about Hinduism is you've got the Gita, you've got the Vedas, you've got the Upanishads, uh, and I know there are others as well. And it's like, okay, first of all, where do you start? Uh, how long do I stay in here? And when do I move on to the next one? To it's like, where is Hinduism for the for dummies? You know, kind of thing. Uh, could you or the cliff notes? I just need the cliff notes. Just give me the bullet points, kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's probably epitomized throughout history, throughout the different spiritual traditions, if you will. Uh, that basically, uh, you know, I think. It epit- it's epitomized basically, I think, by what what you have said, roar like a goddess, roar like a god, if you will, uh, in terms of uh, uh, unapologetical, unapologetically uh, uh, becoming unapologetically powerful, prosperous, and peaceful, regardless of your gender, uh, because I may be incorrect in this. But in the afterlife, if you will, after we leave this body, there is no gender. The only gender that exists is in this material world. Ergo, there is no duality in the spiritual world. And uh, it's something to, to kind of keep in mind. Plus, as you already stated, all of this is temporary. Uh, I, I'm dealing with a bunch of little issues here and there. And I know you're doing the same thing. And our listeners, they're doing the same thing. Guess what? All these little issues, they're temporary. I mean, you'll, you'll resolve them or you won't, whatever. But it doesn't last forever. From ash, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. The paper will crumble and, and uh, bridges will rust and on and on and the list goes on. And in the grand scheme of things, in the timelessness of spirituality, in one sense, I, am I correct, Acharya? None of this really matters. Yeah. So true. At some level, this 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 impermanence that you talk about is so soothing. And 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 the only permanent thing amongst all of this is you, the awareness. 
And as you just watch, you the bridges are rusting, the stars are collapsing, um, galaxies are becoming dark holes, everything is changing. Mm -hmm. And yet that awareness is eternal, is sovereign, that self. And you, it's right there within you. So the more you can go within and the more you can just become more of a detached observer, a witness of all this change, the more you will feel like you're not trying to control the uncontrollable and you're already in control because you are that eternal observer. It, it's really beautiful, Richard. I constantly remind myself of the Buddha um, uh, and his experience. Um, Siddhartha, I believe, was his, his mm -hmm. given name. And how it wasn't until he stopped searching for enlightenment that he got it. And I think that uh, it's one of those aspects of, of this world specifically that uh, we, we begin to really understand when we stop trying to understand. <laughs> uh, it's that simple. It's frustrating. It's paradoxical on one one level, but it's it's really true. Uh, when when you watch, for example, athletes who are out there playing, and 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 this particular athlete is scoring one one shot after another in whatever the sport is, and they're in that zone because they're they don't need to understand. They're just they're in the flow. And I've started using the analogy of stepping out into the river, leaning back on your back and floating. Now, I, my, my eldest sister who just recently passed, uh, she could float on her back like nobody's business. I, on the other hand, for some reason, I just never mastered it. Now, I can float face down. I'm good at that. But, <laughs> but you've, you lay back and you just let the current of the river take you and you'll you'll drift from from shore to shore you know as it as it gently carries you you'll hit you might hit some rapids along the way and then it'll smooth out again and so forth and you just let yourself be carried by but you still have to maintain that that buoyancy and th th that floating aspect uh, and and that's kind of the way life is. I mean, there's plenty for us to do. There's no question. But it seems to me, Acharya, that again, going back to listening to that still small voice, there's your rudder. If let's say you <laughs> could steer yourself at all, but there's your rudder. It's okay if you're getting close to the shore. You know, grab that fruit, grab that vegetable. You know, have a little something to eat. You know, and so forth. Uh, what do you think? I really like that idea of a rudder. It gives a beautiful image. It's like our boat is going here and there through troubled waters and through easy waters. But if you have this rudder within, and when people don't have that, when people don't have a connection with their higher self within, with that invisible self within, all they are is this body. Then if the body ages, they suffer. If the body is hurt, they suffer. If all they are is this mind and this mind is full of like disturbing content, then they have to take pills. But if you are that self, then, and you are something separate from this body and mind, which is more of the boat, then you're just, you know, a passenger in this body and mind situation. And you're enjoying the galaxy and you're enjoying a vegetable here, a fruit there. Some difficult time comes, you're like watching, yep, yep, difficult waves are rising in my mind. There's physical pain in my body, but I am separate from it and I'm watching it and I'm the rudder and I can move it gradually towards meditation or contemplation or taking a walk or even being okay with what is not okay. It's a choice and I can make that. And when people do that, when they get this rudder concept, they're actually able to navigate their way through the tide, the difficult high tides and through the rapids and uh, find, find, find greater, um, greater predictability in their life because it's not so dependent on outer circumstances. Yeah. 
I remember, um, like, I, I'm one of those people, unlike you, I only had one sister, and I lost her early in life. Um, and uh, it's just me and my dad now. And I used to worry about, like, what if my dad dies? You know, what am I going to do? It was like I couldn't breathe for a while there when I was in my 20s. But now, when, now that I have a rudder within me, I realize that when that phone comes at night, I'm going to listen and then I'm just going to, my rudder will tell my breath to breathe. It will tell my mind to, to, to allow for the grief. It will tell my intellect that a great soul has finished its work as my father and has moved on. Mm. So there'll be wisdom along with the sorrow, but it's all due to this inner navigation. When I didn't have it, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> but now I'm going to be breathing through everything. It should make I, all the difference having this inner voice guide you, Richard. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's what I went through when I got the phone call uh, on the 29th of March. Uh, if I recall, it was a Tuesday. <laughs> and uh, actually, when I got the call, I thought they were calling about my father, who just turned 91. Uh, this month, and uh, uh, he and my mother just celebrated their 66th wedding anniversary, and uh, so you know, I'm thinking, oh, it's, you know, because the first phrase was, Richard, I've got some bad news. Now, I knew my sister was uh, was ailing, but this is what's interesting, and you kind of touched upon this a little bit. My, I was told by my sisters and my mother that over the years, uh, my sister lived to be 65, uh, matter of fact, uh, as of our conversation, she would have celebrated her 66th birthday <clears throat> uh, this month. Um, but they told me that in, that she had health issues all through her life. And of course, I knew she had asthma as a kid growing up. I knew that. Uh, and then all kinds of other conditions as she progressed through her life and with her 40-year marriage to her husband. And they said that she was never bitter. Never bitter. Or at the very least, from my perception, she never showed it. Um, but I would venture that there was nothing to show because she wasn't. She just accepted it as this is this is just part of my life, and I'm going to do other things uh, as much as I can, you know, based upon what my physical abilities are. And I thought, wow, what what a what a great example. Uh, I myself am, am struggling through this whole COVID thing, you know, and and uh, I've been through it. My wife had it, and I ended up getting it from her, and fortunately, we were the only two in the house, so we both worked our way through it, testing negative finally, but I will tell you the frustration that I felt, even though I felt great. I mean, I didn't feel like I had any problems whatsoever, but every time I would test, it was positive. And it was frustrating because I knew that I could not, I couldn't go down into town like I normally would to to the store or this or that or the other. I was, I, you know, I felt restricted because of this invisible thing. Uh, and then when I tested negative, I'm going, oh, thank God, oh my God, the restrictions are over. And then I had what they call the rebound, which irritated the daylights out of me because it's like, oh no, not again. And of course, I don't know if that's going to last long, how long that's supposed to last or, or anything. But then he tests negative and it's like, oh, life is good again. And it's just, it's like the ups and downs of, of these kinds of things that we allow ourselves to sort of get sucked into, don't we? And, and a lot of us here in the West, especially, we just cannot, or in the Western culture, maybe, because Europe is kind of the West, Western culture, if you will. We cannot seem to uh, uh, get to that place where we realize, okay, but this is temporary. Because either I'm going to be made stronger by it or it's going to kill me and I'll be in the next world. So it won't matter. Either way, <laughs> it's temporary. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I think what you explained really lucidly was really the human experience of of experiencing joy and sorrow based on the circumstance. But I don't know really now at this point, because I've lived in the West more than the East at this point in my life, I have to say this is universal. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think somebody who's from Thailand or India has automatic more wisdom. I think the work you are doing, the work I am doing, the work our listeners are doing, it's a choice. And it's a coming, it's like we lose, we'll get frustrated or we'll get excited, but then we will come back again and again. It's like circular. So we're going to come back and have, I, though you're saying you were frustrated, I know that you were not frustrated to the level where it was dysfunctional right. or where it took away your joy. <laughs> so I know that you had some frustration and it's natural to have some because mm -hmm. you're not a robo. But at the same time, you were able to continue with your life, your mission, your work, your goals, and come back and be here for everyone. And this is what wisdom does. It goes round and round in circles. So in my own um, school where I have a, you know, like an ongoing teaching program called the Vedic Way, what I've told my students is that we're just going to go round and round the sun and we're going to go round and round in the same learning because every time you go around the sun and you learn it again and again, it's going to get, it's going to get more internalized every time is what I have found. And um, it's an ongoing journey. I don't think sure. once we learn about it, it's going to go away because right. the mind's tendency is to be reactive, mm -hmm. to be completely, um, it's prescriptive based on what's happening outside and it behaves that way. Yeah. But it's the more we develop the sense of the inner goddess, the self, we can observe and then take our decision. So beautifully put. And I would say that what this just means is stick at it, keep with it to our listeners, and it's going to become easier and easier. Absolutely. I like the word grok, to grok, uh, yeah. to assimilate into every subatomic particle of your being, yeah. uh, whatever it is that you are trying to understand and make yourself aware of and, and, uh, uh, and so forth. And uh, that takes that takes time, as you just described. That's the time that it takes, and sometimes it'll take a lifetime. My brother and I were conversing uh, at a family reunion back in 1993. I was 33 at the time, uh, and um, we're to, we were walking in the desert uh, from the Elks Lodge down in Florence, Arizona. <clears throat> and we were just chatting, and I was sharing with him my philosophies and this and that and the other thing, you know. and. He turns to me and says, well, it's about time you get it. And I said, well, you know, it's not about when you get it, but that you get it. And I think that we become, oh, we become impatient with ourselves when we don't get it when we think we should. It's that whole uh, paradox of, God, I want patience and I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> the Upanishads have a beautiful saying which say, those who say they got it, don't get it. <laughs> those who say who didn't get it, probably got it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, again, it goes back to the Buddha uh -huh. who stopped uh -huh. searching and boom, he got it. Uh, and that's an amazing thing. We're talking with Acharya Shunya here on Tell Me Your Story. Acharya Shunya is my guest. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and we're talking about Roar Like a Goddess. I keep wanting to say lion, but uh, you have actually a sketch on the cover of a lion. I love that. Uh, Every Woman's Guide to Becoming unapologetically powerful, prosperous, and peaceful. And uh, yes, guys, it applies to us too, because it's not about um, becoming uh, unapologetically powerful uh, in the male patriarchal context. It's about owning, becoming powerful within your own power, within your own life's purpose, and, and so forth. Is that, uh, is that pretty well sum it up for both male and female? I would say so. It's very well, very well summed up because um, if the outer culture has hall hollowed out the woman, then also hollowed out the man. And we're all feeling disempowered. We're all feeling like sleepwalkers. And um, it's time to really relax into our own divinity, uh, godhood, goddesshood, and to then come from there. And it's not about being Hindu at all. There is nothing religious mm -hmm. in this book. It may, 
it borrows some concepts from a religion, but really it's pre-religion that I've borrowed these teachings. Mm-hmm. And um, it's these are universal teachings, you know, psychology-based teachings and wisdom teachings that anyone of any age, any gender, any sexual preference can embody. And they'll start noticing changes in how they interact in their relationships personally and professionally and generally thrive more, I would say. Yeah. Well, we are looking to do just that, thrive. We're wanting to move from the survival mode to the thrival mode. And I think that your book, Roar Like a Goddess, will very much assist someone in doing just that. So uh, please go to her website. It is Acharya shunya.com we certainly hope that you will maybe pre-order the book it's coming out uh, in september of this year 2022 and uh, we hope that you will uh, check out more of the work she you have a uh, of course we did mention um <clears throat> sovereign self is another book that we had you on the program talking about uh, and then, of course, you've got some other works as well, a newsletter, all kinds of good things, uh, some classes as well that you have to offer through your website as well, I believe. Yes, I have an entire foundation, the Awakened Self Foundation, and we offer through it classes, live stream classes for consumption by seekers all over the world. And my book, Sovereign Self and Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom, have done well. Thank you for your support, Richard. They are they are bestsellers and they are considered classics in their field. And now everybody's excited about Roar Like a Goddess. And I want to say that I was not working on this book. I was actually working on ancient Indian Vedic psychology and wellness. And um, I, there's a nine-day goddess festival called Navratri that I was celebrating along with students worldwide where we talk about the goddess and her strengths. And on the sixth day of that festival, I was typing on my laptop and I felt like my hands froze, Richard. And it's like my brain froze and I just wanted to start a new chat, new page and start a new book. And I finished the first draft in only four months. Wow. <laughs> which is unprecedented because I've finished earlier books in three years, two years time frame. <laughs> My publishers loved it. It's just been like a, it's been like a whirlwind with the universe, the go- the muse of the universe, the goddess and me working together. So it feels very, uh, almost like my soul wanted it. It's like my soul froze my work and she insisted that I write this work and I speak about my own pain, my own journey, my own confusions, but it's not a big part of it, but it's a small part, significant part of it. And then I build on what people can benefit from. Well, I think that people will do just that. They will benefit from it uh, to become unapologetically powerful, prosperous, and peaceful. And uh, we want to thank you so much for uh, participating in this program we call Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and Acharya Shunya is my guest, author of Roar Like a Goddess. I I have those three final questions. I've asked you on uh, your previous visits to our program. Sometimes uh, from uh, time to time, they will change the answers thereof. But I like to ask them anyway. Uh, Before I do, though, I want to let you, our listeners, listener and viewer know that uh, you can uh, hear these programs at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on a Sunday, 1 a.m. Monday morning and 9 a.m. Uh, on Wednesday morning. And we stream those programs live at richarddugan.com. They're podcast as well. And they are at SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM. Uh, let's see what else we've got. iHeartRadio, Amazon Music. And we are also on YouTube with a video. You can watch these interviews. Views. And uh, we also ask you to go to our guest website, which we have uh, in the um, in the uh, clickable option with the podcasts, and you'll see the uh, website up uh, above uh, uh, Acharya's uh, uh, picture there, the, her her image. So we certainly hope that you will go to her website as well. And uh, we are also um, asking you to participate in the Decade of Perfect Vision, the 2020s, and again, asking you to go within and get in touch with that still small voice and incorporate that rudder as you 
gently float down the river of life uh, and experience the things that, that you will experience. We also ask that if you can, we would appreciate any financial support that you can send our way. That's why we have a PayPal account. It is for your security as well as ours. And with all of that being said, we ask those three final questions of all of our guests, no matter how many times they've been on the program, and we're always grateful when they do answer. Uh, and the first of those three is, who is Acharya Shunya? A roaring goddess woman of today. <laughs> what is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you are doing now? When I come back on this planet in some other body, I find that this planet is filled with people who respect each other, are kind to each other, and are supportive of our environment and mother nature, no matter what gender, what sexual preference, what religion, what language they speak or are associated with. And our final question, what is your life's purpose? My life's purpose is to be and to watch everything, enjoy everything. And when time comes for death, I have no regrets. Well, Acharya Shunya, thank you again so much for giving us so much time. And we look forward to having you back again uh, in the not too distant future, maybe before the end of the year or two continue this very conversation. I think that uh, uh, there's still so much more that uh, that ha has yet not been said. Thank you so much, Richard. I love coming back with my books to your show. And I would like to come back again at the end of this year to talk about how the book did and what's happening in the world because of it. Thank you so much. I will arrange that with your assistant. And uh, I thank you for listening to and watching Tell me your story. New paradigms for a new world as we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to Lal and Jeanette, I am listening. <laughs>